recently published book, Sharon MacDonald invites us to understand Europe, or actually any geopolitical entity, not as a single memory land, but as a set of memory lands full of contradictory tendencies, developments, and during the moral reforms, and also great tensions and rebalances. And this dynamic diversity is exactly what uh, uh, why the need for the plural memory lines uh, derives. Recognizing the diversity of McDonald is important for, for a number of reasons, but above all, because by irritating our theorizing, we may lead it in new predictable directions. This form of understanding is attuned with a post-modernist mode of thinking, aiming at drinking to the fore cultural alternatives, unsettling widely held assumptions and opening up new possibilities concerning experience, uh, memory, heritage, and identity. The author is very thoroughly embraced in the era of post-modernity. Different ways of seeing, doing, feeling, and perceiving are taken to constitute a way, or possibly the only way, forward. If our capacity to reflect on our cultural values depends upon interaction with those that differ, then we must encourage those differences. Sir George A. Walking continues by analyzing this. But also archaeologists, like Ian Hodder, argue that in a globalized world, the new imperative is to transcend monolithic perceptions of the past and by extension, exclusive claims and control over it. Hodder even introduces the term of collective responsibility into the discussion that is the understanding of the past as a joint curatorial enterprise. Now, such concerns have greatly affected museums over the past decade. The need to invite the other into our museological presentation has opened the stage to all kinds of mnemonic narratives in exhibitions, written, oral, sonar, we have earlier today, collective or personal. The outcome of this memory mania, however, is yet to be evaluated. Polyphony and multiple interpretations seem attractive alternatives to the authority of official narratives that have also problems. Who is setting the curatorial agenda? What kinds of memory are qualified for presentation and why? What happens in cases of contested pasts uh, or conflicting versions of reality? And what do we choose to bring to the fore and what silence? Now, the museums take the challenge posed by the contested and the unsettled, those without saying. But in order to do this in a productive way, museums should first outline a theory of good practice, which will take into consideration what we believe are pending parameters of current epistemological manifestos. And what we have been discussing in the last session is a very good example of these pending parameters. Only by settling the unsettled in our epistemologies, we may begin to view the study of the past as a fountain of conflict or problem resolution. Such epistemological sorting out, however, requires that we adopt the critical stance also towards our own uh, ideas or against the postmodernist doctrines that inform most of our work. Now, let us talk briefly about these epistemological questions. It is often said that museums uh, seek to contribute to the resolution of problems, but before embarking on the resolution of the problem, we have to define it. Now, how do we, how do we define problems when we are dealing with divided societies, such as contemporary societies we have discussed these? But let's, say, let's broaden our view and discuss other things like contested materialities, like, for example, the Elgin marbles, that I suppose you all know. Is it possible to define the beginning and the end of the problem if there is an end in a linear way? Or should we try to discern and explore the different and sometimes conflicting temporalities created by this problem? Mia Zim, uh, I cannot pronounce the whole uh, surname, <laughs> sorry for that, discussed uh, yesterday how the Cyber's Divide has redefined the view of the past rest uh, retrospectively, and Mitchell Pilaris also discussed how opposing parties of the Greek political scene arena have developed very different temporal accounts of the post-war period. This can also be seen in a much simpler conflict 
uh, like, for example, the one I refer to the Elgin Marbles. If you visit the uh, website of the British Museum and the Trophy Museum, you will find out the temporal divergence, which is entirely problem related. These are the landmarks they have, and the reference to the Germanis is made to be uh, uh, by the Trophy website. So, uh, this is understandable because there is the history of museum, and one would expect that at least the period before 1800 would be would have a common uh, way of presenting. Okay, wrong, entirely wrong. The problem has led to a radical reinterpretation of the pre-1800 history, and as you can see here, they all agree on, on the fact that the monument was built. 25,000 years ago, and that the fatal year was 1687, but otherwise it was an archaeological ruin for the British Museum, but uh, it was almost intact for the Trophy Museum. So, uh, given the open access now to, to the websites, and this is something, thanks of course, that we have started discussing, and the, the impact of, of this technology on how history and all these ideas, uh, the ideas of history, uh, come to the public. Uh, these timelines, you see, we have quite a lot of followers. I don't know if they should be called viral, as we just uh, mm -hmm. said yesterday, but certainly it's, it's something which is very worth uh, exploring. Now, similarly with space, what space is the problem? We want to refer to Occupy and how do we map it? Do we simply fit it in a given special uh, framework? Or are we seeking to understand how relations among involved parties determine the real or national space of the problem? Both images are from articles about Newton and Leibniz. Now, Katerina yesterday talked extensively about fragmented space. Uh, it's Kostadina, so talked yesterday about fragmented space and disconnected geographies and the third space created by the division in the Korea. And apparently the new maps, that also the maps of two talkative symbols, the pentadactylus and the leading flag, do not only inscribe symbols on the landscape, but they define space to the flag. And to enhance Constantinus' argument, <laughs> for the third space, I add here this image of the little Buenos Aires in the midst of uh, Trollos. Uh, so, uh, it might be very interesting, not only in this, but in many other cases, to explore how these such kind of symbols have an impact not only on the political, but on the perceptual level. And I remember Constantina yesterday night, last night, saying to me that until she was, she was born after the conflict, after the uh, 1974 invasion, she said that uh, while she was a kid, she thought that the world ended in the war. And this is the, the, the perception of many kids in world cities, in cities with divided walls. So, trying to map the problem, it might be interesting to try to include these parallel, contrasting, or anyway, different divergent temporalities and spatialities. Of course, we do not ignore that any definition of enterprise has a reduction in the basis. We said the Sertop has described maps as rhetorical tropes aiming at constructing a totalizing space. And when we're trying to build geological narratives, we're actually creating maps. In order to define the problem, we totalize in the single theme a condition that is far more complex. And this entails the danger of proposing a treatment for a very complex pathology based on a single symptom. But the question is whether it, there is an approach where we can do without spatial temporal definitions. And the answer is more or less negative for the time being. The best proposals in the area of museums so far advocate the adoption of alternative specialities and temporalities, which practically means the shift from what we knew in the past as national or colonial narratives uh, to the narratives of, narratives of sp smaller formations, for example, local communities, minorities, and so on. However, one should be careful here. Too much insistence on locality may end up reproducing a territorial view of the past that's a history based on the veneration of land and landscape, 
which is not qualitatively different from a modernist worldview, if only by means of perspective. This is a problem common in some recent exhibitions about past conflicts in the Americas and in Australia, which tend to venerate and even personify indigenous land as ancestral and attribute the moral the right to an old past. This re-territorialization of history does nothing more than attempting to resolve problems using the same material that created them in the first place. Namely, the notion of the land and the past as properties. What is more, in such efforts, alternative histories of exalted and dominant narratives are devaluated <coughs> as authoritarian and oppressive, often forgetting that these dominant narratives are not only ideological constructs destined to legitimize power structures, and at the end of the day, the notion of an ancestral land is no less ideological, but also material resources which have shaped the mnemonic consciences of large part of those societies and are difficult, if not impossible, to approach. So prioritizing alternative narrations may be instructive, educational, and perhaps socially just, but when we have spent so much time, so much energy to relativize the significance of narratives altogether, it is also methodologically flawed and politically problematic. We suggest that a possible way to look forward is by placing the problem in a new multi-dimensional spatial-temporal framework which may allow viewers to perceive how the problem, conflict or other, and the ensuing, <coughs> sorry, and the ensuing measure, uh, memory fissure have generated diverting conceptions of time flow and space structures. Such an approach avoids to evaluate or challenge existing histories, mnemonic structures of narrative schemes about the examined events. Instead, it questions the integrity of the frameworks in which the various types of collective accounts have been formed. This may eventually allow more subtle distinctions between transmitted and acquired memories, which may motivate people to think how they have learned to remember things that they have not actually lived. Something like that was attempted in 2009 by the Alston Museum of Belfast in the famed by now gallery of travels, who decided to present uh, where they present a two-sided version of the past 50 years of Irish conflict in a way that has been described as dry, sterile, apolitical, the title may explain why, and also as creating an unsettling sense to the visitors. And five years later, it remains upon the reference, discussion, study, and public engagement. In one of the few occasions where the notion of intercommunal conflict in Belfast is publicly addressed. As one of the executives of the museum says, said, you can't resolve this stuff. People might expect a definite exhibition that the impact of the travels is unresolved, so the gallery is unresolved. What he actually says is that museum alone, museums alone cannot resolve any conflict or any other problem. They can only create conditions of discourse among previously opposing parties. This is exactly <coughs> what, for example, the Museum of Immigration and Melbourne is trying to do now with the notion of identity and its formation process, and it will be very interesting to learn about the impact of this on the future. Now, in order to create conditions of discourse, museums should exploit some of uh, the advantages they have forgotten in the will of the postmodernist critique. One of them is their structural conditions, their materiality. While social memory is negotiated in various arenas, from literature to history to theatre and media, museums have a physicality that allows remembering to acquire a material and also a very performing dimension. Museums, as well as ecological sites and monuments, are places of return even in the postmodern landscape. And people do not cease to visit such places perhaps because they are infused with the capacity to endure time, as Parliament Hockey suggests. So, also visitors rarely feel the discomfort served by intellectuals for the institutionalized, nationalist or colonialist past of museums. In an interesting paper about the aforementioned exhibition of Brad Belfast, the author explains that although some uh, Catholics 
remember the Ulster Museum as a unit is Protestant stronghold. Others uh, had a very positive reminiscence of it because of their school visits. Several authors have also discussed the ability of museums and other heterotopic places of being vested with a wide range of ideological projections by those who visit them. Over the past decades, for example, the Acropolis here in Athens has been associated with the market crusade we discussed, the Greek tourism campaigns, but also have been included metaphorically and physically in political problems <coughs> of employees and many other uh, demonstrations. So now this brings to mind concepts related to the agency of place, but in the Deleuzean sense of the assemblage. According to Gilles Deleuze, an assemblage is formulated for a purpose. Once this purpose is fulfilled, the particles of the assemblage develop centrifugal trajectories. This suggests that an assemblage is a mechanism of temporal, or to put it better, conjectural collectivization. It is a form of communitas which does not impose a collective identity but rather stresses a sense of belonging which is time and space specific. People do feel part of an overarching whole but only during this spatial temporal environment on the occasion in which they are. <coughs> the concept of the assemblage may prove analytically effective in cases of post-conflict societies. It may pave the way for wider social formations without dismissing the peculiarities of the particles. The particles escape, yet they, they are also attracted by the assemblage. In the era of multiple subject, uh, subjectivities, fragmentation, and individualized memory, people still tend to look for ways to connect to acts of mnemonic solidarity, and we need to recognize that. As a physical space, the museum provides an arena for such practices to take place that to take place in a performative and also in a discursive manner. They encourage collective ways of observing, walking, thinking, and talking. And if we look at this kind of performance from the perspective of the assemblage, then the discussion may shift from the modern attributes of a museum visit to the immense body of affordances that the physicality of the museum space contains. And this physicality provides a means for connecting and reflecting upon this connection without surrendering alternative readings to a top-down form of collective identification. And the last point it is because of their function as spaces of assemblage, bridging gaps between grand and small-scale narratives and uh, ideologies that museums may have been broadly relevant to society. There cannot be, there cannot be much doubt that in the modernist period, the museums have been a successful the question is why. And this is a parameter that the, the answer is not given. It, it is a kind of question that deserves to be explored in more depth. For example, why early museums uh, became started and were established at, uh, uh, as, as uh, proper social institutions. And we do believe that this has to do because of their ability to bring many, many, many social actors together rather than only being you know, agents of uh, state ideologies. An example from the, uh, sorry, an example from the uh, first exhibition in the National Historical Museum of Athens, which was established many, several decades after the emergence of the Greek state, and it was the first museum that was dedicated to the new period, the, the, the history of the late medieval Ottoman uh, period and the early years of the Greek state. The first exhibition there was created by the inventor of the Greek national narrative, who was Constantinus Papagopoulos, and who was titled Monuments of the Holy Struggle, meant to illuminate the rebirth of the nation. Uh, but as there was still very little material, all individuals and families possessing of relics from the War of Independence were invited to, take, uh, uh, to make offerings for the exhibition. These included groups with highly conflicted, conflicting political interests and very different social or even ethnic backgrounds. But most of them replied with trust and fervor according to the enthusiastic reports. And later the president of the Historical and Ethnological Society expressed the following idea of the collective. This exhibition, visited by millions of Athenians, brought profound enthusiasm toward Greeks, but also activated the memory of the pan-Hellenic struggle and the honor of those who fought for the Greek nation. As a narrative that was directly related with a greater national project, 
managed to bring together intellectuals, the clergy, donors, but also a very wide public in a period during which, uh, during which national, religious, linguistic and re uh, regional divisions were still very strong or stronger than national identity in the country. So this is a phenomenon not yet sufficiently explored. In seeking to offer a solution to the historical problem, the exhibition managed to produce a thesis that acquired greater <coughs> value. And it managed to do so not because the narrative itself was unflawed or convincing, at the end of the day it was just some years that the whole narrative had been constructed and a couple of years that it was adopted in school education, but because it offered a new perspective that overrode earlier conflicts in the pan Greek society in a place of assemblies that allowed for unexpected encounters and temporary coexistence with social others. So to conclude, we suggest that in order to contribute uh, to the resolution of any conflict-based problem, <laughs> museums should first try to change the space of temporal frameworks in which they base their approach. Second, exploit their potentials as dynamic places of assemblage, that is, as temporary shelters for performing actions of social and mnemonic solidarity, rather than as repositories of diverse yet concretized memories. Uh, and well, we conclude by saying that museums have been successful not when they look back in the established modes of history <coughs> making, of history representing, but when they look forward into fresh ways of thinking about the past. And this is what they should try again if they wish to make the study of and the uh, and reflection on the past to become a joint curatorial enterprise as Ian Hopper has suggested. Thank you very much.